What's up, everybody? This is Fred Ricciani of TSC. We have right here via Zoom a very special guest. He's an acting legend, a martial arts legend, an entrepreneur, the founder and head of Film One. You may know him from a number of films, including the legendary Tiger Claws. We we're talking to the legendary Jalal Mary. Jalal, thank you so much for the time. How's everything going? Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Before we get to how you got to this point in your entrepreneurial and film and TV journey, I want to talk about what's going on with Film One right now. I heard you have a very special, well-received restoration project going on, right? Yes, uh, the Tiger Claw series, one, two, and three. And uh, it's coming out on Blu-ray anytime soon now. And uh, we're already accepting the uh, pre-orders. And uh, it's doing well. And TC2000, so they're all coming out. Uh, we restored it right from the uh, 35 millimeter masters. So it's pristine. It's amazing as if it was shot yesterday. It looks very good. I'm very happy with it. That's fantastic. And I understand too, you also just wrapped up working on the circuit series that we could be on the lookout for. Yes. Uh, so, uh, and everyone, the ones that know about circuit one, two, and three and same characters journey, except right now also we're adding to him uh, a possible son that he didn't know about because he be on the circuit three, he's on the road and uh, uh, running away from everyone he loves. Uh, but he doesn't know that he left a seat somewhere. And, uh, you know, that adds complication to the story. It's quite interesting. It's pretty interesting. And it's a very interesting time in showbiz, right? We had a period of time for years when it came to action films, characters, IP, where they'd always want to recast, right? I mean, I think Spider-Man is the most notable example of that. And we've seen over the last five to 10 years that really a, a lot of people love certain IP and they want it to continue. We see that now with the streaming services. Of course, you're continuing the circuit legacy with the circuit series. Do you find that these days with all these streaming services that more people are reaching out to you about some IP that maybe you thought you wouldn't go back to? Uh, definitely. A lot of uh, projects went back to life uh, and the audience is there. The audience is still there. I mean, we had a, uh, a period of lull i would say you know uh, we slowed down on the action films and but we we were very busy with tv we did a lot of project i did six seasons of the conspiracy show i did soccer dreams uh, uh i did uh, i would say four or five seasons of uh, kind of pet rescues i did the botox queen of new york uh, 13 episodes so i've done over 200 episodics tv in the last eight years, but I didn't do any action films mm -hmm. or action TV. And uh, based on the reception I had, as soon as I put things online, we immediately got orders also for new TV shows and uh, actually even films. And I'm reuniting with some old talents that we worked with. I'm, I like to always go back to the same people I worked with, as long as there's good taste in my mouth <laughs> from the relationship. And I'll, I'll, most of them are wonderful, wonderful people. And uh, with some new talent, too, that's coming up and we will we'll be showcasing. So uh, it's actually quite exciting. One of your colleagues and real life friends that a lot of people love is the legendary Billy Blanks. Could we possibly see him back in the mix? Oh, he will be for sure. I just finished shooting with him. He has a very nice, exciting episode in the series of the circuit. So he joins us there too, along with uh, Olivia Gruner and uh, a few other wonderful martial artists. And also uh, a lot of younger talents. And you've had, of course, success worldwide, including domestically here uh, in, in the U.S. I know you go back and forth between uh, Canada and, and the U.S. primarily. But do you feel like with the age of streaming that it's made things a little bit easier as far as the world getting smaller? Like, I'll just give you an example. Like, these days, of course, you had a hit show in Vikings, technically a, a Canadian show. You have Working Moms on Netflix and uh, a bunch of these other shows as well. So do you feel like these days a lot more people in the U.S. are more open to Canadian programming? Well, I mean, I, I was never considered Canadian programming. I mean, my first two films, actually, when they got released, I remember in Cannes, uh, we, I went there for the screening of Tiger Claws. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, in the description, the distributor was a U.S. distribution. And at the time, I had a deal with Universal Studios, mm -hmm. with Universal was releasing it in North America. Uh, they actually wrote U.S., as made, because they didn't write Canadian because it doesn't fall into the Canadian format. Uh, 
So I never really had that problem one way or the other. I always had a foot in each place. Uh, and since I'm dual also, I'm able to work in both you know, places and both countries very comfortably. And you were definitely ahead of the curve back in the day, still are. Of course, I mean, you own the rights to, I think, pretty much the majority of your content and your work. And on top of that, you look at some of the special effects you did in your, back in the day with the green screen now, which I, I can only imagine the work uh, that that took. So looking back, like, do you really feel like that, even though some of the things you did might have been a pain back then, that they're really paying off right now? You know what? I never complained about any of it. Don't forget. Uh, I mean, for, for me, it was a dream that came true. And whatever I did, people call me sometimes smiley. Don't you see the world burning around you? You're calm and moving forward and putting out fires. So, you know, it's never burning in my mind. In my mind, I'm just doing what I need to do to get the project done. So you're not going to see me angry as I'm working or flustered. Uh, I just work as much as I could and I make sure the projects are done. But when you're talking about green screen, special effects, the difference today and yesterday and talking when I did Expect No Mercy, it's it's so huge. I mean, we had 26 computers rendering day and night for weeks to get stuff that you could render now in five minutes, 10 minutes. Um, we had so much work and we had to use at the time blue screen before the green screen because for film we used blue screen. And uh, I mean, you had to light it perfectly in order to work like you could not go now you could digitally track things and clean it and do it it's a different world now with the editing uh, software you could do a lot of the work on your desktop at the time everything had to be optically done and cost a lot of money now that your youtube channel is at the point of at the time of recording it's over 122,000 subscribers that am i did it surprise you a little bit like wait a minute there's still people that not only remember me and think fondly about this but also have a demand for my action content uh, it actually moved up pretty fast because i did not really open it up properly till almost a year year and a half ago mm -hmm. so that happened I believe pretty fast because before I just had few things there and nothing much and I never pushed it. Mm -hmm. But the moment I start seeing other people trying to put my stuff illegally on their network and they were showing millions of views on my mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. So I immediately took action and I had to shut them down and I realized, oh my gosh, I'm losing a lot by not having enough confidence in my own stuff. And uh, it just moved like lightning the moment people discovered what it is and i could see it's growing every day uh, so you're talking really the growth to where we are in less than a year or a year that's the growth like the major growth when you look at the line of growth of the film one youtube channel definitely and we recommend all our subscribers to check out the film one youtube channel a lot of great t content a lot of full series a lot of full movies so if you're in the mood to binge watch some awesome content definitely check them out now of course you're not just known for your awesome action films you're not just known for a lot of your reality content as well and, and being an entrepreneur you're known as an epic martial artist so i'm just curious let's go all the way back to when this journey first started what came first for you martial arts or show business martial arts definitely i mean i've been doing it since i was 11 years old and that's what opened the door for me into show business although i studied film but i remember my professor in george brown college uh, in Toronto, uh, telling me, listen, buddy, uh, he had a nice English accent. He was like six foot something. He is, you know, uh, a guy that you would feel, oh, he belongs in movies type of thing. And he was writing a script and he's an artist. But somehow he was of the mindset that if you are, don't look like him, you don't belong somehow. So he actually told me to my face one day after we did the whole scene, and he said, you know, you did good today, uh, but you know, listen, don't waste your money, son. You should just go do something that, that is good for you. Maybe he thought I'm, I'm using my last dollar to get into the school. He didn't know I was doing well. I was successful in my jewelry business. So it's not, I didn't need money, but I, I, I think he felt bad for me that, you're not going to make it. You know, he told me, listen, not even one in a million make it, guys. Why are you wasting your money? So, uh, but uh, I don't want to say much. Uh, you know, five years later, uh, I released my first film. I think he was still trying to sell his 
for script. So we're okay. Of course, full disclosure, we're longtime friends as well, real close with your son. You, my dad and your dad actually went to the same elementary school back in the day in Schweifet, Lebanon. Just curious, did you go from Lebanon to Brazil? No, I was born in Brazil. Okay. I was so, born in Brazil. Then I came, uh, you know, and my parents uh, wanted me to go and get to know the grandparents. So I went there a little bit. Then I came to Canada. And when did you discover martial arts? Uh, in Lebanon. I started in, uh, first I started, my uh, older brother was uh, doing Taekwondo with some friends in Beirut. And then after that, uh, I joined the club myself. And, uh, but then the civil war broke. So I came to North America. Then I joined, um, uh, I was jogging in High Park in Toronto. I didn't know anyone yet. I was new. And I see a guy jogging, wearing a Kung Fu t-shirt for a Mo Chao club. So I followed him. I think he thought I'm trying to hit on him first. It's like, hey, what do you want? And he was ready to punch me. I said, no, no, I just want to know where's this club. I always wanted to learn Kung Fu. And uh, then he told me the address. I went there. So at least somebody introduced me to somebody. And uh, the rest was history. I was already fit and flexible. Uh, so all what I needed is molding. And uh, they helped me and molded me. At the same time, a couple of years later, I went back to the original. I was studying also Shotokan. And I continued with that till my second dan. So martial arts was first. And then I started competition. And uh, I never looked back. A lot of people helped me to go around to compete. Uh, I wasn't competing just in Toronto and Montreal and Ottawa. I started competing in the tri-state. I started competing in Ohio. And so I expanded the circle of competition in the late 70s and early 80s into the state quite a bit. Uh, then there was a big tournament in Florida. It's called the uh, Florida Open. And it used to be in, um, I think it's called Treasure Island or something in, in Tampa. And that was one of my bigger tournaments. Then I was invited to another one, Bermuda Triangle. This was a like, three-day tournament, top of the action people in North America by invitation only would come in. And uh, so I've done a lot of tournaments. And also I had my own tournament after a while, once I won a whole bunch of tournaments a grand championship in especially in weapons and other things so i had my own tournament too and we called it the diamond challenge and that one was with partnership with a friend of mine at the time uh, bill pickles and pickles was a very well-known and talented martial artist and uh, competitor and he's well known in the area older than me so he had a lot of people in the industry that he knew so we gave actually the biggest uh, gifts at the time for the grand winners. So we don't give them just trophies. We gave them diamond rings. We gave them cash. Oh, wow. So a lot of people, including your buddy, Sonny Ono, he won one ring from me over there. Um, I believe Langs, uh, Tokyo Hill, Cynthia Rath, uh, they all won jewelry in those tournaments. So it, it became a very popular tournament for top American competitors too, because they want to come and just, win something that's viable it worked out for you on the acting side and of course your martial arts, arts career definitely came in handy but when you really started blowing up in film in the 90s a few other things were blown up as well a little organization called the ufc in japan you had pancrase of course you also had k1 kickboxing as well pro wrestling was starting to make a comeback a little bit your personal friend sunny ono of course later became the japanese liaison for WCW and all the different foreign talent and everything. Did you ever have yeah. any offers or contemplate getting into pro wrestling or mixed martial arts at the time? Uh, we did try to get mixed martial arts in Canada at the time. I remember we, uh, but it wasn't allowed any contact. And so we backed off it. And uh, it, then in the nineties, after a while, after I did my first whole bunch of movies and it was successful, I actually slowed down just to be with the family. I had to. And uh, it actually, I don't regret it. So for, I would say, seven, eight years, I really slowed things down into almost nothing, uh, just so I could have more attention to my family and my kids, give more attention to them. I didn't realize that once you do that, other people are jumping in and moving forward, even trying to duplicate what I did and try to move forward. So uh it's the thing about entertainment it 
the moment you slow down, there's somebody hungrier than you. It's going to take your place and move on. It's not, and when you get back, you're actually not getting back the same place. You're getting back a lot further down the line. Then you have to, you know, try to make up for it. So, but I don't regret a thing. Uh, you know, you move in, want to slow down for action martial arts. And I found I wasn't able to do it for the satisfaction I want. I did other things. I did TVs. And I've done very well with TV, and uh, so it gave me a, a nice bridge and a chance to continue. You had a very successful jewelry business, and correct me if I'm wrong, the story goes that you eventually sold that jewelry business in order to fund your filmmaking and acting career. It's one thing to say, you know what, I'm going to get into show business, I'm going to become an actor. It's another thing to say, I want this whole thing on me and to be the guy running the show as well. So when did that light turn on for you, and when did you realize that you could actually make this a reality? Okay, that was a bit gradual because the first chance I had on acting, uh, it was by chance. I won a grand championship in weapons in one uh, tournament. And there was a producer there looking for a bunch of martial artists for a movie that he was uh, producing. And it had in it, it needed a group of martial artists. And he needed them different colors and, and different looks. And I was one of the looks. So he picked me to be at the time what he wanted to be typically uh and i worked with him through it so he brought us in gave us the scripts and they started training us so we could you know get to know the show and each take his role but then gradually i started realizing my role was a terrorist role and i did not want that uh so i actually refused it that think about it now the guy said well you because you're fusing you want to be you'll never be then because once you say no once you never be but financially i wasn't hungry i and then he saw me i think from the window when i got down and i went down and i got into my porsche and i drove away then he asked the other actors and i heard this from the other actor which were buddies of my martial who the f is he like what does he do oh he has a uh, jewelry uh, wholesale and bunch of stores Oh, okay. So I guess he doesn't need this. They give him my address of the wholesale office. He calls, makes an appointment. I go there. Hey, you don't. So he talks. He said, now suddenly he sees me as a source of money. He's a producer. <laughs> he says, well, if you don't want this, you want something else, you could invest. You could get investors, blah, 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 all these things. So that was one experience. I said, wait for a while. Then another group wanted me. Also, they knew I do the martial art. They knew about that project. Said, no, we got something else for you. They wanted me to wear a mask and be a double for another young guy. I was in my 20s at the time, late 20s. And uh, I said, so you want me to do all the martial art and jump and roll and do all of this? And then he'll take off the mask and he'll take credit for it. After I went for a while back and forth, the guy was so arrogant. He got on my nerve. I said, I'm not the actor. I just said, I'm not doing it for him. So after these two incidents, I said, heck no. I want to use, do my own vehicle. And now I still had the jewelry business. So I did my first film. I put in a small budget. And I figured, you know, we do a low budget thing. But gradually start growing. And gradually I realized that filmmakers, sometimes they give you a number. It doesn't mean that's the number. So when we hit the $500,000, I told the guy, well, okay, now we're going to do the post-production. How are we going to pay for that? I told you the budget is 500. He said, oh, 500 for the production or full? I said, what? We agreed 500,000 for the production. Production means pre-production, post-production, production, post-production. It's a whole movie. Oh no, this is uh, like, I thought he was full of it anyway. So we went through it. I paid for the extra, we finished the movie. But so the movie was a Black Pearls was a calling card more than anything initially. But because of Black Pearls, I got to Universal, I got to Shapiro Green House at the time, I got to uh, Cineplex, uh, and they saw quality filming. Definitely not the acting. The thing is, what I learned is I was doing so many things, working in the office, managing my business, on the phone back and forth, and being on sets was exhausting. So I figured I got to do one thing or the other. And that's when I decided to sell everything. I bought a studio in East Toronto and built it up, set it up. And I said, that's it. I want to be 
I'm going to be in film business. I'll make my own studio, my own production. I'm good in sales. I'm good in this. And that I never looked back, actually. Uh, I mean, I, it's not the, because I was never about the money in my life. It was about doing what I love. And if my money gave me what I love, that was good enough for me. I mean, I, anyway, you tell them, hey, you took what? You took two and a half million dollars and you bought the building. I actually bought the studio, bought the building. I didn't just rent. And then we started Tiger Claws 2. And I paid for writers to do, and I pitched it out. I remember one guy in Telefilm Canada, when I showed him the script, because they're all about artistic films, he said, oh, only your mother and aunt will watch this. You know, they, this is not going to work. And you know what? Any film they've done, I don't think has a classic till now that people are still following and running after. So I've, uh, I've done better than most of them did. So I'm not complaining. But and I never looked back. Uh, immediately, I got a whole bunch of films financed and moved forward. And once you're successful, people come and throw money at you. So you better be careful how you handle it. Like it's it's there. But also, the enemies will grow too. You're gonna have a lot of people you think they were your friends that are enemies. I mean, I would get phone calls that are prank calls. I mean, there was there was no. Uh, at the time, you can't see who's calling you. Or do you yeah. call, you know? And uh, I would get, hi, is that film one? Yeah, this is film two. And it's like things like, boom, they hang up. <laughs> and other people call, hi, we're calling from Universal. We want to make you a star. And then they will hang up. <laughs> like people will just call it stupid. I had so many calls. And I know all of them were people that know me and are idiots, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> it's fun. Yeah. You, you went head first into this. You never looked back. It's, a, it's an incredible story. But I would imagine because you didn't have a, a film background that you might have been prone to some mistakes. Were there any rookie mistakes that you made back in the day that you look back to you like, man, like if I, if I had known. Well, I'm definitely. I remember my first movie. We have a scene. And they kept repeating the wide shot again and again. And the camera guy, the main guy, and he's a lovely guy. Eventually, we got to know each other and he understood me and understood him. I guess everyone was trying to make his own reel. They wanted the sun, the moon to be in the right place, this in the right place. And then I said, listen, we can't, it's action, it's martial art. You can't repeat the same action 10 times. It's, people, people are exhausted. Then when you come for close-ups, we couldn't even move. So I start realizing I got to take command of these things a little bit more because the crew did not know what it takes to do it. They thought, hey, you could do a, a, a flying spinning kick 10 times in a row. No, you can't, especially if you're the whole day, 12 hour, 13 hour on set. And then the end of the day, you're doing the final fight of that night. You're doing all the close-ups where the money shots are. Hey, you did it in the white shot. Now you can't do it anymore. So these are a few things. So I started calling, little pushing a little bit against the DP, pushing a little bit against the director. But sometimes when you push against the director, what happens? He stops directing. He says, okay, if you really know what you're doing, do this. I no, no, I need you for acting. And I'm not a good actor. So I was like, I know. So you have push, like you start seeing a little bit of push back. But to me, the important thing was the martial art. And I started realizing even my performance was suffering was suffering because I could not physically do certain things. Like I'm exhausted mentally and physically. So these are certain things that happen. But again, I don't regret in the end, the product is there. What I would do again is I would have a little bit more separation. I'll try to build a relationship more with people that you know and bring them on board that will look after you. You need to be protected. As an actor, if you're on screen, you need to be babysat and you need to be protected. Sometimes people don't realize what it takes from an actor to give a good performance, especially if you're doing action and trying to act. It's immensely, immensely draining. And you want to produce at the same time, you want to direct at the same time, and you don't have the budget to have doubles, you're in trouble. Wow. That's, it, it, so would you kind of compare that to like an athlete, even like a, like a fighter? It's, it, it, you got to protect the athlete from themselves sometimes. You got to make sure they have the proper yeah. training, proper nutrition, and that they have the right game plan going in. Yes. And also, you don't want them sitting there on the side of the ring, getting their own water, you know, mm -hmm. and ice, 
putting on their eyes. It, like you need to be maybe sad a little bit. You need to be taken care of. You need someone to say, hey, you know what? You might pull a muscle if you did this. You just been doing a whole bunch of scenes and dialogue. Now you jump into a fight and then they want to change the lights and the weather is cold. And now, okay, let's get back. We change the lights from side to side. I, you know, when you're on set, you know what that takes. It just took two hours. You froze now. Okay, now let's do the same scene from different angle. Okay, could I go warm up a little bit? Well, we have it lit already. So you start, because it's your budget, you start thinking, if I don't do it, I'm going to lose time. Then they'll shut down. You put the lights down. You know how the lights have to warm up. Mm -hmm. Like there's so many things in place. The camera guys are sitting and waiting. Okay, you know what? They, so it, it takes a while before you know exactly what's going on. And especially if you're on set all the time because you're actually a producer and you're directing a lot of the action. Uh, you're, it's not like the actor that goes back to his trailer where a double is there in their place till they get the perfect shot. He just has to walk in or she, and be there, take the shot, and they're only focusing on acting. There is a big difference. So, yeah, I, what I would do it, what I would do definitely, I would have a whole separation. You need that for a good performance. You need that whole separation. I, I mean, you've had so many job titles worn a lot of different hats. Of course, family man being uh, above all else at your peak, as far as when you were acting, choreographing, doing all the stunts, teaching and everything else, how did you juggle everything? How did you not go crazy at that time? And you know, were able to raise a family and everything like that. As I said, uh, it's tough to go crazy. I wouldn't because uh, I don't overextend myself. Hmm. What I do and everything I do, I'm doing out of love. Like there wasn't a single thing. Even when I go at home to see the kids, it's out of love. It's not, oh my God, I got to see the kids. If I'm reading, writing, if I'm choreographing, it's because I love it. When I'm shooting, it's, it's because I love it. Uh, like we'll finish shooting by two, three in the morning. I could barely see in front of me, but I wasn't angry. I wasn't upset. I was like, the only thing is, okay, what do I have to do tomorrow? I got to start planning tomorrow. We have this, this, and that. Also, I want to make sure that the money from the distributors is in place because it's pay payday. Then I got the list. Who are we paying? How much? Are we staying on budget? What you have, what I was good at is looking after, making sure we're on time and budget. How? To me, if you are late one shot, you lost an hour. Yeah. If you lose an hour a day in twenty days shoot, you just lost two days of shoot. Simple. If you lose two hours a day. You lost four days of shoot. Four days of shoot, you're talking about minimum on low budget, $100,000. On high budget, a few hundred thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. So to me, any shots that had to be before lunch had to be before lunch. Any shots had to be after lunch had to be after lunch. I never liked having crews work more than the hours there. Might go 12 hours maximum, no more. I did not like the 18 hour days that they, my crew sometimes say, oh, that set, we worked 18 hours. To me, 18 hours, you're looking for trouble and you're looking for accidents. So we did not do that. Uh, I'm glad I came from business because I remember having that discussion with my first filmmaker when I told you about 500,000. And he said, oh, this is art. It's film business, you know, like it's artistic. You don't know the budget. I said, no, no, it's called film business. Film and business. Business is you got to be on time, on budget. Listen, we have leeway 10%. No more. Your leeway is 10%. No more. Good. The 10%, it's in the budget. But anything above that, we're losing money. And the servitors don't like that. Really, I, I feel like this has been a master class on how to run your own film company and, and just really kind of run a business and stay on top of it. And I love the fact that you talked about like, hey, I don't want to do these 18 hour days, screw this burnout. I mean, I feel like every workplace, especially when it comes to entertainment, whether it be film, whether it be video games, there's so much crunch culture, grinding hustle culture that you forget that these are human beings. And you know, at the end of the day, safety physically and mentally should be paramount. Oh, de de definitely. I mean, I, I see sometimes younger guys and trying to impress their bosses and they literally enslave others. They push, they'll be pushing the whip and trying to scare you with the guy above you and above him, to me, that's abuse. Mm -hmm. And the problem, 
is a lot of people in film business think, oh my God, if I say no, I'll never work again. Because there are gatekeepers that sometimes don't let you work. But there is always another project somewhere else. There's always something else. I believe if you're good, you can make it. It doesn't matter what genre, like no excuses. Anyone who says, oh, so-and-so, I can't make it because so-and-so, I can't, nonsense. I'm a guy that when I started, they only wanted to put me in roles, either cover my face or have me as a terrorist. I, instead of getting upset, I changed the approach. So, and I made something that was needed. And if, the, if you do something that they could use in the business, they're going to take it from you. No one says no to making money. As long as you're a decent person, don't try to cheat anyone. But give me something I could use. I don't care who you are. I don't care where you came from, what's your color, what's your nationality. Give me something I could use. And I found out people in power are the same thing. All you have to do is give them something they could use. Give them something they need. Find the hole somewhere and go find it. Like find something somewhere. Like when I got uh, Soccer Dreams into Fox, it was the right time. There was a place. They needed something. You get in. So it's like, how do you get in? How do you get universal? How do you get here, there? Alliance, blockbusters, before they went out. I had three picture deals with them. And they could have stayed in business. I mean, I because I, I knew the executives there very well. And, uh, you know, one of the last executives they had is a good friend of mine till now. And the only thing is, they, the only reason they went out of business, uh, it's greed of shareholders to cash out. Mm-hmm. But they had, they had the money. They actually... One of the executives, the person, he approached me down. He said, guys, we own all these product. We could go digitally and have same thing what Netflix is doing. They, he offered that we could do it. They, the old executives on top of him and the money people which want to cash out and sell the properties. Uh, they said, no, we're all about uh, them coming into the store. And if they come to the store to rent one movie, they're going to buy popcorn. They'll buy another old movie. Because you remember the old used movies used yeah. to be. I, you were too young. So their thought was not wrong. But it was wrong. Because they did not see the future. And the sad part, the executives who saw the future lost their job. And they didn't make money. <laughs> but uh, so uh, to me, they were good. To me, I did very well with the last three films with them, and which was The Circuit. And the rights reverted back to me after. So, you know, that's all good. Because what I do when I make the movies, I license them. I do not sell them. Very smart. Very yeah. smart. Obviously, it worked out. And I'm sure you had to have some foresight as well, right? To, to, to think that, hey, one day, you know, no matter the medium, I don't know how many people foresaw streaming, you know, 20, 30 years ago. But I'm, I'm sure you thought in the back of your mind, you know, like, I want to be able to have residuals from these for the rest of my life. We're yeah. trying. The good thing is, we're able still to produce and we're producing a lot of new stuff that is good and giving us room to breathe. So, and we're okay. I, listen, I'm doing what I love. It's all about doing what you love to me. Uh, you don't work a single day when you do what you love. So just enjoy it. Now, before we let you go, we always like to ask all our guests some kind of random rapid fire questions just for fans to get to know them better. Are you ready? Go ahead. Please try. Favorite late night snack or cheat meal? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, I'm into nuts, like, you know, Zura, the nuts, just, the, you know, yeah, all kinds, pistachios, uh, uh, yeah, nuts. Most awkward moment as an actor? Uh, sex moment, love moment, they're the worst. <laughs> Most awkward moment as a filmmaker slash producer? Any awkward moments when it came to filmmaking or when it, when it came to some of the series that you've produced? Uh, definitely, uh, we had that, and uh, I mean, there, there's a. I'm not saying it's most, but it's always something. Uh, I was in a meeting with uh, a major executive, and I didn't know he, and I didn't know that he had people above him. We were in a huge boardroom, like twelve, thirteen, fifteen chairs boardroom. We had like four or five people. And I'm discussing a multi-picture deal with everyone in the room. 
and the voice in there, hi, this is so-and-so there on the speaker came from the middle of the table. Think of like a big, huge thing. I don't want to say the network or the group. And the voice came and I, we talked a bit. Uh, but the, the voice was a little bit belittling me in a way. It's like, yeah, well, we want you, but uh, not like the uh, chop sake stuff you do. And a few things like it, I just felt everything he was saying is like, I want you, but not this. And that's when I said, like, then why do you want me? This is what I do. I'll make it better with better budget that you give me. And I, by the way, I saw the last films you guys released for the money. It wasn't on screen. So I insulted their last film. I didn't realize that he personally was behind it. <laughs> I didn't realize that he is God. And yeah, that was um, awkward because that was the end of the relationship with that network. L well, lesson learned, right? To an extent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I just, he kept pushing me in a way I felt that, uh, I don't know, it was just natural for me to defend myself. But again, sometimes you got to shut your mouth and just move on. And one of the executives there said, I worked so hard to get you there. You blow it in one sentence. I said, well, I, I couldn't. I just couldn't. Oh, man. But hey, I'm still alive. There you go. Yeah. I know this is a hard question, but I got to ask you to narrow it down a little bit. Favorite spots in Lebanon? <sighs> Honestly, it's like simple little creek in my grandparents' hometown and land. Like really, it's called Harbiye. Uh, it's like little creek, gorgeous creek. Uh, as a kid, I used to go there and drink the water directly from it. That's how beautiful and sweet. And uh, it had all the fruits, everything, that uh, little piece of land. It had from bananas to grapes, all kinds of grapes, to like so many fruits uh, in it. It's not even like, it's like a piece of heaven on earth and lots of water. And I remember sitting next to the creek, just listening to the water and take the food with me, sit down there, drink, use my hands, just pull up my hand from the creek, drink. And uh, such peacefulness. And I keep thinking of it all the time. I, wherever I go, I say, oh, this is almost the same. You know, I was in Bermuda and I remember passing by a little area and it was similar. And they had similar fruits there too. And one of them is called the Echidinia. I don't know what's in English. And it's like, uh, I don't know. There are certain places that really affect you and stays with you. You're really good friends with Sonny Ono. You guys kind of came up together. He, of course, is famous yes. for being an on-air personality in WCW and, and the liaison for Japan for WCW. I brought him up earlier, but I didn't ask you outright. Did Sonny Ono but, ever ask you, hey, Jalal, are you going to come to WCW? Uh, no, I mean, he does what he does. I do what I do. No, he didn't. I, would listen, I, I do different things, but we communicated a bit in the beginning. Then we lost contact. He got busy. I got very busy. Uh, I remember him also on set. And after being on set, uh, he'll bring his daughter with him. He had a little baby in the 90s. Uh, now must be a young lady, uh, early 30, should be 30, 31 years old. And uh, to me, he was a dear person. But again, life moves on. And you start because sometimes you have a lot of wonderful people you love that it's almost like a revolving door. One moves in, one moves out. Mm -hmm. You love them all because you build so many relationships. And uh, it's funny. We had, uh, we were in 2019, I was uh, entered into the Black Belt Hall of Fame in Canada. And then all these old faces were coming, people I haven't seen in 35, 40 years, or 30 since competing. And then you see, start, they're come and hug me. And moments of like that were lost so long ago come back, a certain warmth. Then you realize I'm so rich, like that I have so many people that I actually care about and care about me. So they see me more because of the movies. I don't see them, but you only have so many hours a day between your family and kids. And I, I try to be as, how should I say, as uh, loving as I could to everyone I know, but you could only do so much. I mean, I don't, I can't even answer all the Facebook. I know I don't, like my on my Facebook, there's only 5,000 people. So I could get in 5,000 and get rid of some older ones that I don't recognize. And you can't even accept everyone. And people, a lot of people 
will send me messaging through Facebook. I don't answer because for a while I tried it. My phone kept on ringing and it was random people I don't even know. So I, so I, I don't use Messenger at all. Uh, so people who really know me get to me, just let them comment on something. I'll comment back and somehow I'll get to them. But uh, yeah, it's very, it's very hard. Uh, it's very hard. Uh, sometimes I try, I want to hug everybody, but I, I can't. So I'm, I'm, I'm lucky and that I could go back different events and meet different people. It's funny. Like from community of martial arts to community of jewelers, like JJ now is back in the jewelry. And because I kept the business, my mom kept and, and the for those that, for, and, and sorry, for those that don't know, JJ is your son, one of your sons. Yeah. 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 So yeah, my mom kept one of the retail outlets going till the uh, late 2000 uh, and then 11. And then my son, JJ, got into it. So a lot of my old friends are, you know, there and, uh, you know, going in. Like a few days, uh, last month, he was at a friend of mine place, uh, a well-known rabbi. He's really big, one of the bigger uh, jewelers in there. And then he FaceTimes me just, hey, look where I am. You know, it was nice to see them again. You feel like, oh, my God, I love those people so much. I was with them for 15 years almost on a daily basis. And between that and the filmmaking and the martial art and the jewelry and the community and the, it's uh, I'm overwhelmed with love, honestly. Speaking of love, how important is it to pick the right partner? Oh, it's this. It's I think it's key. It's key because if you can't have peace at home, you can't have peace anywhere. Very you might so. as well not have it. Honestly, I'd rather people separate than be angry with at each other. You don't want to go home and say, "Oh my God!" You don't want to dread going home. You want to love going home. So that's important. Yeah. What what made you <laughs> in recent years say, you know what? I, I run this very successful company. I've done everything under the sun. And I'm a family man. You know what? I'm going to add another thing to my resume. Opening a restaurant. <laughs> well, I mean, that, that's, that's, I can't uh, take credit for that. That's uh, my daughter and my wife and my son, uh, my, my kids. Uh, they, they did it to me. I'm just financing it and just walk in and uh, say hi and eat a good sandwich or a nice plate of whatever. But um, hey, why not? If that's what they wanted, they listen, they did it for last seven years, very successfully, five stars, four and a half stars right through. Um, it's, um, they did very well. I mean, if it wasn't for COVID, we'll be going strong again. But just now because of COVID and everything, we decided to just Guys, it's too much for us, everything. And I, because I can't help you there either. So um, take a break, five, six months, and then see what happens later. But they did very well. I'm very proud of them. We're going to ask you, what's the best piece of advice you give everybody for success? Work. Love your work. Just love your work. That's it. You got to learn it and love your work. You'll succeed. It doesn't matter what you do. Anyone who succeeds in anything, I see people doing things that never came into my mind i never thought of it and they're successful they loved it pick something you love and do it find a way to do it different than differently than somebody else did it you'll succeed it's not always about money by the way it's happiness and enough for you to live i mean listen, you can't work for free but you gotta succeed in it and enjoy your life have enough to live good life it's there fantastic jalal thank you so much for your time it was an absolute pleasure before we let you go where can fans find you and Film One online? Filmone.ca or film-one.com. Jalal, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Take care.